this question of um, the aggressive lending, why is there so much money chasing around the world trying to find a profit, is a key question which we're trying to explore in quite a few of the sessions today. Um, so hopefully there'll be lots more discussion around that. Um, in this last 10 to 15 minutes, I, I just wanted to focus on two um, particular questions which I think your, your contributions throw up, which have a particular bearing on, on what we're trying to do today. Um, the first one is obviously what are the implications of this for the main challenges around debt that we're facing at the moment, to, to, to draw that out a, a little bit more. Um, and, and Joki, you, you touched on the kind of victories of the, um, the, the Jubilee movement in terms of, of um, developing country debt cancellation. Um, but many people will know that there are large um, numbers of, of um, uh, debt problems, many countries in the Global South, who didn't make, uh, make it into the HIPIC process, which was the, the process which was this kind of victory of the, the Jubilee movement, um, because at the time they weren't poor enough. Um, and those countries are many of them now facing significant problems with totally unmanageable debts, um, which are continuing to grow as, as they are having to borrow just to service debts. And we do a lot of solidarity work with campaigners in countries like Grenada, Jamaica. Grenada's been in default for um, a year, um, and, and Philippines. Many of these countries. Um, facing um, up to kind of 20% of their government re revenue every year having to be paid on debt repayment at the expense of health care and the protection of, of um, provision of basic services. Um, and even countries who, who made it into the HIPIC process um, are also now finding that they are um, uh, facing unmanageable amounts of, of sovereign debt. And then obviously we've got the enormous sovereign debts which um, countries in the um, Eurozone are facing also as a result of the bank bailouts and the financial crisis. Um, and also there's, um, and we've got sessions today on this, we, we're also facing, as people have touched on, a, a personal debt crisis. Um, so just in this country, um, there was some statistics from the government's money advice service last year, which said that 18% um, of the population now, that's about 9 million people, are really struggling with serious debt problems in this country. Um, we had food, food banks um, feeding about 60,000 people last year. And the TUC says that we, this has been the longest period of um, real wage cuts since the Great Depression of the 1870s. Um, so there's some real, really kind of quite crunchy questions for us about what does if a more just morality around debt mean for these real challenges around sovereign debt and personal debt um, that we're facing today. Um, Iceland, for example, um, in its response to the financial crisis, um, drove forward um, really significant state-led write-downs on personal debt on household mortgages for families who are really um, struggling with mortgage repayments. And rather than cutting public services in response to the crisis, they actually extended public services because they thought people would, would need more support in the context of an economic crisis. Obviously, we see the opposite of that with austerity across much of Europe um, and um, in the UK as well. So what does, what does this mean? Should we be looking more at um, state-led personal debt, forgiveness, cancellation, um, but also what do we need in terms of a global movement to challenge all of these new sovereign debts which have been built up? Um, and, and the, the second question, which also has a real bearing, I think, for what we're talking about today, is what are the limits to this concept of debt forgiveness? Um, obviously, it's core to really challenging the injustices of debt that we're talking about, um, and we need to, to really push forward with um, uh, really highlighting the costs of, of unjust debts and the responsibility of the creditors. But does the concept of debt forgiveness hide to some extent the real root causes of, um, of unjust and illegitimate debt. Um, people not being able to earn enough to, um, to feed their families, so having to rely on debt in order to, to cover basic needs. Um, 
countries in the global south continuing to have enormous quantities of wealth extracted through tax avoidance, tax evasion, through um, extraction of natural resources which primarily profit multinational com companies in the global north, um, located, sort of listed on the London Stock Exchange, for example. So, so how also do we go beyond debt forgiveness to tackle these real root causes of um, illegitimate and unjust debt? So um, I'd like to throw those back to you, if that's OK. I <laughs> don't know if who wants to start. I mean. Could I um, just put three things on the table there? Um, one is picking up a point you touched on, which is of particular interest to me, as I'm currently chair of the trustees of Christian Aid. And one of our main focal points recently has been the campaign about tax transparency, which is actually very closely related to the ethical questions we've been talking about here. The fact that there are companies who do not um, pay adequate levels of tax in the countries where they operate most, most fully and most profitably, that is, again, about the obligations that are not recognized and not dealt with. It's about what is owed without being mentioned. So I think tax, tax transparency is part of a general strategy on this that we have to be very serious about. Second point is exactly the point you were making about looking at root causes and therefore looking at what it is that creates and sustains dependency in individuals and economies. How do you get beyond that? How do you get to a situation where people are to some significant extent in control of the circumstances of their lives and able to provide freely for feeding their families and sustaining their own, their own um, well-being? And the third obvious one, which I think is pertinent here in this country and pertinent internationally, is the question, what are we actually proactively investing in? What are we investing in? Are we investing in a future of security, the creation of a healthy economic public, economically healthy public, put it that way? Are we actually pushing the boat out to create new forms of employment nationally and internationally? Because the insistence on debt repayment in its current unrealistic form is entirely backward-looking, and surely we have to say, well, what, what do we do that's forward-looking here? Mm -hmm. Just three things, Jo. Thank you. And Jackie? Um, when the HIPIC initiative was introduced, um, the World Bank decided to take part of it, to be part of the process. The IMF kind of opted out. Um, and when, when you looked at what the HIPIC initiative was offering, it was clear that um, what the debt campaigners were calling for and what the World Bank or the, the lending institutions, including uh, the London Club and the Paris Club and the G8, what they heard was something very, very different. And, um, and I think this is one of the one of the challenges that we have as campaigners, that as we make demands and put forth put forth um, positions, we are sometimes not very clear about what is it exactly that we mean, so that there is sometimes an interpretation that is given that means we don't get what we want. So the first HIPIC initiative um, had certain requirements, including compliance with, with structural adjustment programs for six years. Um, we said, no, no, that's not what we meant. So in uh, the second, uh, the HIPIC two process, we actually used to refer to it as the HICAP process. Um, <laughs> The, they said, okay, maybe not six, three, three years of, of compliance. And this was announced at the, uh, just to date myself a little bit, at the 1999 G8 summit, which was held in Cologne. And um, I remember uh, the response was that we said, break the chains of debt 
not polish the chains of debt, mm -hmm. which is what we felt going from six years of structural adjustment programs to three years meant that they were really not breaking the chains but polishing the chains of debt. And this was also, by the way, the response of the South African Council of Churches. Um, there are certain things, tax justice is one. There are a number of things that um, in the uh, developing campaigning that have come up uh, as ways in which we can begin to get a handle on the, on the cycle and the structure of debt. But I think that um, I want to highlight three different things. Uh, one of them, there's been a call for the repudiation of debt, um, whereby countries just say enough and put a stop and that's it. You know, the world won't stop. I mean, and, and, and this fear that if a country defaults or a number of countries default that this will be, mean the end of the begin, the end of everything is not true. Iceland is a case um, that we can, ha we can lift up in that. So the question of repudiation of debt. The question of reparations. I know this makes people very nervous, very uncomfortable, but I think it's something that we should seriously look at as campaigners. And I think it is a position and an argument that has been made by campaigners in the South and I think that if it is echoed and embraced by campaigners in the North, it would give governments, and especially lending governments, some food for thought. Um, if there is an, uh, some, it would require an accounting, an, ad an, an audit that would really begin to shake up this system which has remained, yes, they agreed to a little bit of debt cancellation or debt relief, by the way, I would never, and I hope you all, I want to, I don't know if I can ask that bishop to be the one to charge you not to use the word debt forgiveness because it has so many, I know it is forgiveness is what forgiveness is, but in the context of debt, I think it has so many negative values associated with it that puts the burden and responsibility on the borrowers and none on the creditors. And I think that we, we have, and part of what Jubilee South really fought for was the changing of the language. So we don't talk about creditors and debtors. We talk about borrowers, borrowers and lenders. Um, because it does begin to change the dynamic. So the question of reparations is one that we need to look at very seriously as campaigners and um, because it's also one that does address and get to the heart of this matter of the creditor's responsibility. If you're going to be charged with paying reparations, it requires a serious examination of that relationship, that uh, transaction that happened. The third thing that I want to highlight is um, a process that uh, a number of northern campaigns, including the Jubilee UK campaign and, and others were involved in a few years ago, um, we spent about 10 days in Italy, in Colovecchio, developing a document that was looking at the responsibilities of creditors and the res responsibilities of borrowers. Previously, a lot of the campaigning and the focus has, had been on um, the borrowers, the so-called debtors. So everything was said that they, what they were doing, what they had done wrong, and what they needed to do in order um, uh, to merit any kind of debt relief, any kind of debt cancellation. But this process that we were engaged in with, uh, we called it um, a, a platform, a, the a sovereign debt restructuring uh, mechanism, sorry, not the sovereign debt structuring me mechanism, but um, it, I can't remember the title. It's just gone out of my head because I got another acronym uh, in there. Um, <laughs> you know what happens. Uh, but it was, it was a document that was looking at how um, 
borrowing governments needed to behave and how lending governments needed to behave, saying that um, there were processes in both borrowing and lending countries that could hold governments accountable and should hold governments accountable. So that when the UK government is going to lend to the Kenyan government, there is a process that where, where civil society, let me use that term, civil society at large in the UK and civil society at large in Kenya is looking at that process and saying yes to this and no to this. Uh, looking at what are the considerations. Is it uh, a loan that needs to be contracted? Is it really going to benefit uh, the, the, the countries? Is it a loan to, as Andrew was saying, uh, to facilitate the continuation of paying of old uh, debts? Or is it a loan that actually has merit and value uh, for, for the country? So we need to look at a relationship whereby instead of just, as we used to say, the finance ministers talking to each other when they're borrowing or le borrowing and lending to each other on behalf of their countries, um, which means that the only thing that is looked at is the financial part of it, not sometimes the environmental, the social, the, uh, the other economic aspects of it. So where do we have, how do we as campaigners come up with a process whereby there is transparency, there is tra transparency in the process, uh, there is transparency in the trans transaction and therefore the responsibility is held on both sides. So that if you make a bad loan, then you make a bad loan and there are consequences. If you take a bad loan, you take a bad loan and there are consequences. Not the current system where I make a bad loan and you have all the consequences and the responsibilities for it. What is that system that we can have that would begin to break, in a way, break this entrenched system that allows one side to um, be, um, what is the English word I'm looking for? Um, to bear no responsibility, to be free of responsibility, and then the other side to bear all the responsibility until the end of time, because some of these debts are so old and continue to be paid and continue to be serviced with no sight in end. That is the nature of the system, and that for me is partly where we need to begin. How do we break the cycle? How do we break the system so that it is not a self-fulfilling cycle that uh, can never be broken and continues to be built upon. Thanks, Njoki. <laughs> Andrew. Well, I want to say that I, I really do agree with Njoki's um, uh, rejection of the paradigm of forgiveness. <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, I, I understand uh, the appeal of the paradigm, but I think we have to reject it for a whole number of reasons. It does primarily because it does imply that debtors have done something wrong. Um, it's just too much associated with, uh, with traditions of charity and benevolent paternalism. Um, and um, it's, it's dispensed by those who have, uh, who have the, 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 the wealth to do so. Um, by contrast, uh, I mean, I prefer the language of refusal uh, debt refusal, debt repudiation, reparations, cancellation, um, all of those judged according to reasons of justice and not reasons of uh, charitable goodwill uh, dispensed to those considered to be needy. Debt relief is not actually all that much better in my mind because um, debt relief uh, leans on the same kinds of uh, traditions, um, more humanitarian ones perhaps. Uh, is, debt relief is usually dispensed in a sort of one-off manner um, in the same way that uh, humanitarian aid is dispensed in the wake of a natural disaster. It really doesn't address uh, the, the conditions and, and the causes and the reasons for the disaster in any way. And it doesn't build necessarily build an, an alternative infrastructure that would avoid some of those problems. So how do you uphold um, how do you uphold the right, however, in in an economy which is so heavily fueled by predatory lending? 
Well, we have governments that are supposed to do that. We have elected officials who are supposed to protect the citizenry from economic harms imposed upon them by the creditor class. And if you look at the record, especially in the North, I mean, there's a long record in the Global South of, of, of falling down on that score. But in the Global North in, in the last decade, especially since uh, the financial crash, uh, we've seen governments for one reason or another, for all sorts of reasons, are unable to provide the relief or have not been able to provide the relief. And so in response, it's perfectly justifiable. In fact, I think of it as a deed of democracy for people to take relief for themselves by any means necessary and to do it according to reasons of justice, according to reasons of um, restoring the moral economy of, of a nation or restoring the moral economy of the household if we're talking about household debts in particular. Uh, so it's very important to, to think about refusal and repudiation and debt resistance in terms of protect, a protective act of democracy, a way of salvaging popular democracy. So that's the kind of language I, I, I really do think we, be, we should be using. Um, so just to, to summarize again, uh, forgiveness is not empowering. Um, it's not a paradigm that empowers those who have been forgiven. In fact, you could argue that it introduces an extra layer of indebtedness. Someone's doing you a favor, right? And the expectation is you will, um, you'll behave yourself and might return that favor. Uh, at some point in the future in ways that are not entirely consonant with, mutu with mutual aid. Mutual aid is more of an egalitarian type of uh, relationship. It's more, uh, it's more of a democratic, fundamentally democratic paradigm. And secondly, um, debt relief, even large-scale debt jubilees, um, and even if they're cyclical, it's very difficult to carry through a cycle and stop that, that spiral of asymmetry. I think you, this is the way you described it. Um, they don't necessarily do anything uh, to, um, to build alternative economies. They don't alter uh, the debt money system for the most part. They're simply you know, one-off correctives. They clean the slates. And then the cycle of accumulation starts all over again. Um, which is one of the reasons why they're, they're sort of popular to some degree with economic elites and economic managers. They like to talk about one-off uh, programs uh, of debt relief or forgiveness, but they don't alter the system. And so what we need to be doing uh, really is um, in parallel with or in tandem with engaging in acts of economic disobedience, which are, are as I say, justified as acts of democracy, what we need to be doing is building an alternative economy at the same time. One that is based on socially productive credit and not on predatory lending. Credit is not a bad thing. Um, everyone needs credit. We can't imagine an economy without credit. It should be socially productive credit, however, that is uh, ethical financing, principled financing, if you like. Um, and every, I'm sure many people in this room have their own ideas about um, how to build that alternative economy. Uh, there are already elements of it that, uh, that we engage in and participate in on a daily basis. Uh, if only you look around the landscape. Uh, there, there are non-capitalist enterprises and patterns of exchange that we engage in all the time that are not based on predatory lending. And in the aggregate, they amount to quite a considerable chunk of economic life. Um, so it's not a question of uh, mounting a takeover of the state in order to bring into being an alternative economy. There are already elements of it in existence, and we need to, we need to start recognizing that. Uh, I would just end by saying that a lot of people who, th who, who think and, and, and are very active on the landscape of alternative economies see the future as commons-based. And this is the general, I'm talking about the general, generational lifeblood of politically active young people, perhaps under the age of 40, for whom <laughs> commons-based and mutualist enterprises and initiatives are the way to go. Um, because of the history of neoliberalism, they're fundamentally distrustful of public action and of state action. 
And uh, perhaps I'm over the generational threshold, but to, to the degree to which I'm very sympathetic uh, towards commons-based initiatives, I do think there is also a place for public action and state action, and there, and there needs to be in this alternative economy that is not debt-fueled, that is not predatory debt-fueled, we need the public and the commons to be more conversant with one another. And so I see the alternative economy that we need as a mixed economy, one in which the public and the commons cooperate. Um, I don't see us transitioning to, for example, to a low carbon economy very quickly without public and state action. I don't think we can do that simply on a communist basis. Um, and we could, I could cite many other examples of why we need public and state action. Um, so I, I do hope that some of the, I'll, I'll stop in a minute, I do hope that um, some, some of our discussion in the course of the day um, it, it really deals with some of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, of building that alternative economy, which goes beyond and I think has to happen alongside our critiques of the debt money system and our critiques of the political burden of indebtedness, because here again I'm echoing the point that we're not just talking about the debt burden as an economic burden, it's also a political imposition on democracy that we need to, uh, that we need to escape from. So, I may just say one thing. Um, I, yeah, just one thing, which is to say that the Jubilee South position on the issue of debt is for 100% unconditional debt cancellation. And as you travel your day to day in all the different places where we'll be thinking about debt, marinate on that. Um, <laughs> okay. 100% unconditional debt cancellation. Thanks, Njoki. Everyone, before you go, we've um, quite an important um, announcement. There's some really key themes which have come out from this, and quite a lot of artists also are exploring this as well as campaigners, and we're really lucky to be part of one of those art projects today. I'm just going to invite Adina Azadeh to come up and just talk about the Burning the Books project um, and how you can take part in it. Hello. Debt. A sum of money owed. The state of owing money. A feeling of gratitude for a favour or a service. An incomplete transaction. A broken agreement. A social interaction. A moral obligation. Debt as the shadow side of wealth. Debt as sin as power, as dependence, as inequality, debt as plot, as trap, as promise, as social stigma, as injustice, debt as anxiety, as struggle, as dysfunction, as disruption, as secrecy, debt as a Pandora's box. Debt as the poison gift, as virus, as pleasure, as freedom, obscenity, excess. Debt as a form of slavery, a form of violence, a loss, a death, a dead end. Debt as taboo, as absurdity, as powerlessness, as confession of guilt, debt as crime, fear, confession, lament, purgatory, hell. Debt as a sign of poverty or as a sign of wealth. Debt as the basis for revolution. Burn the records, redistribute the land, take control. Debt as illusion, a question of perception. Facing and confronting debt may bring communal reckonings, biblical jubilees, rolling jubilees, cancellation, write-off, alternative economies, ethical credit systems, creative ways to refuse, resist new challenges to and repudiation of questionable agreements between often proxy parties. Debt reframed as an opportunity to change paradigms, 
agree new forms of interdependence, exchange, mutual aid, the commons, gift, and generosity, a basis of community, a call to respect human rights and seek long-awaited justices. Mercy, redemption, absolution, truth and reconciliation, relief, gratitude, freedom, compassion, connection, turning points, turning it inside out. This is the Book of Debts, volume five, of a series of 10 touring the country. There is no debt without a story. This book asks for and accepts stories of all kinds and all scales, financial, social, emotional, political, historical, ecological, spiritual, existential. What is in your book of human accounts? What is in our book of human accounts? What would you have written off today or wish to draw attention to on any level that affects us all? Money, social injustice, time, love, attention withheld. It may be a debt that's a burden or a form of gratitude, a debt that will be repaid or should never be repaid, or a debt you share with others. We all owe or are owed something. Cover its pages today with what you consider most needs to be given voice or what you would like to be momentarily free of, whether personal or third party. The book will be in the Brunei space here until the final plenary. And you can contribute online, burningthebooks.co.uk, or via Twitter, at burningthebooks, at any time. This book of debts will be open and readable online through April and May, journeying with me through Brighton and Hove, resting its spine in between at the Fabrica Gallery in Brighton. Then, on Thursday, May the 22nd, at 6.30, during the last week of the Brighton International Festival, it will be recited aloud and burned on the streets of the city. Let's surface the stories, define the debts, and burn the books. Thank you.